you know, remember I I'd raced hundreds of events before I, I I started planning running the world. It then took me 674 days to finish that mission, to complete that that mission that I set out for four years prior, two years of planning and then two years of traveling around the world, hopping from country to country, running a marathon in each one every few days, um, running everything anywhere up to you know, between two, three, four and five countries a week. Um, and physically, I was always challenging myself. I was always changing. I was always adapting. I was always stubborn to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Simple as that. And I truly think sometimes resilience can be the glossy word for stubbornness. And I think I think stubbornness is, is the reality of, of going, no, I will finish this. I will complete this. Well, a little stubbornness might be what's missing from your life right now. On Seekers Mind Talks, today, we have Nick Butter. He is an endurance athlete, a best-selling author, and the first person on the planet to run a marathon in every country in the world within two years to set a world record. I had a fun and deep conversation with Nick and was able to learn a lot just from his mentality, which I hope you guys will be able to benefit as well. I'm your host, Raj, and enjoy the conversation with Nick on The Seeker's Mind Talks. So let's start from your story. Uh, it's not that everybody gets that idea. Gosh, I need to run the world, every country. How did you get there? How did I, how did I get there? I guess it was a, a long journey where you get pushed towards doing that, that big something, it, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be running a marathon in every country in the world, whatever that may be. Um, I think everybody gets pushed towards it through lots of influences from family, from friends, from circumstances, from your job, from finances, from the whole range of the realities of life. For me, it was working in a corporate banking scenario, office life, and needing to have some escape from the office. So running, you know, running to work, running back home after work, and on lunch breaks, on any time I had in the day, to try and get outside away from the concrete buildings and, and into nature and to soothe my soul and my mind. And as that started to progress, I started to get into running a bit then for fitness as well as just to escape. And then that expanded further. I would start racing. I then started to race pretty well. Uh, and then many years later, uh, I was running in the Sahara Desert and I met a brilliant guy called Kevin. And he had a story and he had a message he very sadly had terminal prostate cancer. Uh, I'd never met him. I'd never experienced speaking to somebody in that environment that was very ill uh, and potentially was only going to live for another two years. His diagnosis was, was around two years. It was a stranger when I met him and now he's a great friend. He's lived past of it, way past his, his life expectancy given by the diagnosis. And he's just an exceptional guy that gave me the message of don't wait for a diagnosis. He said, don't wait for something to happen. So you end, end up in my situation. He was 49 when he was diagnosed and he just wished he could have done something more with his time. And so I got a bit obsessed by wanting to raise some money for to help fight prostate cancer and to help other people in his his position uh but also around the concept of time and valuing our time and, and not throwing it away um and i think very very few of us intend to throw away our our time but it so it so easily happens that days and weeks and months and years pass where you're not really following your dreams you're not really living by your passions or by what you value um, you're just fumbling from one day to the next earning money, trying to be the better version that you can be, but not essentially being being the best you could be. So I went away from this race, kept in touch with him, and I said, I want to raise some money. 
and I googled it. I googled had anybody run a marathon in every country in the world. I wanted to find something that was unique. I wanted it to be something that would get some headlines. I wanted it to be big enough to raise a quarter of a million pounds. Um, and we've raised, you know, coming up to two million pounds now, and not just for Prostate Cancer UK, but for for um, for other charities, for my own charity as well. And everything snowballed. So so that was where everything started. I I thought. Um, let's do this. And then two years it took me to plan it. Uh, and and then I set off and little did I know what the journey would be like, but it's it's changed my perspectives um, hugely. You came out as a different person. I think yeah. a lot of people go through the same situation, but you've been fortunate, fortunate enough so that the world gave you that message through yeah. uh, through your friend, right? Yeah. 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 And other, otherwise, we are all stuck in this thought loop because I, I'm, I'm, I also work in corporate. I've been working for past three, four years. And you see that every Monday, you see that in people's face. Every Friday when they go out, mm. they see that happiness. I, I say to them, that's how life should be. But then they say, come to reality, come to reality. But, but that push, you were fortunate enough to get that push to see a different life and how valuable and precious life could be i think right i think you're right you're right and that, how you describe it as being given that push is exactly how i felt um the way i would describe it in addition to that is that uh, kevin was the push over the edge to make that decision but leading up to that point there were lots of other push minor pushes small incremental pushes towards the edge of that cliff that were things like, well, starting running in the first place, having conversations with the right kind of people, going to um, talks, lecture series, um, learning about alternative careers. So actually being open to that was the first step. It just didn't feel like it because when you're stuck in a corporate cycle, whirlwind, maze, whatever you want to call it, you get trapped and you don't believe that there's other opportunities. But as soon as you start to open your eyes and, and just explore, then that's when the, the gateway will, will open. Yeah, we don't want to be putting the wrong idea out there. For people who love their job, who love their career, it's all well and good. They're living their life to yeah. the fullest. But sometimes we shy away from what our internal self is yeah. telling us, right? A lot of people kind of just push it inside. They just want and and uh, how 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 do you make that mental change? I, well, I th I I think the very simple mental change is to say, well, if I if they stopped paying me to do this, to do my job, would I do it tomorrow? And that's a question that I think if you ask a big proportion of, and let's face it, the the Western world, the developed countries we are fortunate beyond belief we are incredibly lucky and so that is one one hand incredibly fortunate and lucky but on the other hand that's then drawing us away from taking risks because we are comfortable and so if you ask the question take the money away would you still do it a great deal of people would say no i wouldn't of course i wouldn't go and work in the office for no money why would i do that um there's a there's a handful of people that i know that would absolutely continue doing what they do and i think that's fantastic and rare and i'm envious of that that's fantastic um i've you know i've had to work hard and taken some brave steps and had some courage to go i'm going to leave all of that behind i'm going to say no i wouldn't do that if i wasn't being paid i'm going to go and do something else that i enjoy and it doesn't matter if I'm getting paid. And so you're right. There's a there's a there's lots of steps to take in there. Um, and the other thing I'll say on that point is, if you get into bed at night, and you've had a you've had the day um, behind you, you can reflect and say, well, how did I live that day? Was I happy? Was I around the people that make me happy? Was I giving back to the people that make me happy? Was I making them happy? Um, was I in a space that I find enriching? I love being, I live by the sea. I love being by the sea, by, by beaches, by coasts. Other people love being in busy, bustling cities, whatever it may be, um, and just reflect on it. And if it's not, then 
start to make the change, start to make a change, even if it's do exactly what you're doing now, stay in the same job, but maybe go and do it in an environment that makes you slightly happier. Or maybe you love to climb. Maybe you love going climbing, but there's nowhere you where you live that you could go and climb. So make time, go somewhere else and don't fall back on the excuses of, oh, no, I can't do that because I don't live anywhere near a climbing wall or I don't live anywhere where I could do that. Or I don't have any time because I've got to take the dog out or take the kids to school. You can find enough time, um, but it takes a lot of a lot of pieces to uh, of the puzzle to come together for that to happen. Mm-hmm. We, are, we we humans are a machine like i see this way we humans like to be comfortably numb and mm-hmm. whenever <laughs> yeah I, i think it's it's a basic human there are studies about human psychology too that's like neurons that fire together wire together and there's research coming about default mode network where in which you the state of homeostasis you're in your brain wants to be in that and whenever you try to break out of yeah. it it tries to pull you back every moment and i think you experience that even now and you were experiencing that in your two years of training while you were running after that and every time right yeah. and what yeah. do you tell to yourself at that point i i think it's the perspective i think it's the perspective i mean it's very hard for me now to talk about a time before i went and did this this crazy mission because i now have the perspective of having done it and so every time i catch myself doing something that isn't enjoyable or not valuing my time i think of the privilege that i have and the opportunities and the freedoms that other people don't have and how it is within my capability to go and do what i want to do if i want to stop running if i want to stop doing anything to do with sport maybe i want to i don't know get into writing poetry or going and being a potter making making pots whatever it may be an artist that is something i can do and i think it takes a great deal of um steps to have the belief for you to do that because even if everything is presented to us I, I, and a lot of people i know are in the same mindset where even if the options are on the table and available to change things or make an alternative path it still feels too scary to do so um and so con- constantly reminding yourself of the privilege that you're in and go look well if i leave that job and try something and it doesn't work I can go and get another job. It's okay. And I think it's a case of being rational about it and and giving yourselves a real l- logical pathway of okay, I'm going to leave my job. I'm going to not quite have enough money to be okay and be as stable as I was. I'm going to try this. If it doesn't work, then this is the job I could get and this is when I'll be okay again. And if you can kind of kind of go through that process, then it gives you at least an opportunity to explore that that out that alternative way hmm absolutely absolutely ah uh, they 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 say that after you get attention from people you're the same person but people just start recognizing you or understanding you do you feel that mm-hmm. way do you feel as the same person before and after or certainly your world views changed you acquired you saw a lot of things that you quite didn't literally expect so yes. you will have changed in that aspect but as a person from the inside do you feel you have changed or do you think you've been the same no i i don't think anybody stays the same i don't think no matter what you do if you do the same job if you do the same hobbies if you're around the same people i don't believe you stay the same because the very nature of human beings and mammals and living is that is that not living is the end the end of the spectrum and so time passes and we evolve um we evolve everything from our eyesight look at the our eyesight as an example we don't our eyes don't just stay the same all of our lives we look at screens we damage them with the sun and with all that sort of stuff and it changes everything about human beings is a constant change and constant evolution and i think the sooner you realize that we're all you know, different i'm certainly different from today than i am yesterday um in small ways i've got older um 
I, you know, every, from a biological level to a psychological to a philo philosophical level, everything is is gradually changing. Some things, you know, more severe than another, but um, I think it's a continual continual change. So we were talking about how the brain tries to resist change, right? And I was reading this book. It's called Atomic Habits. I think it was written by James Clear, and it says that habits change you every day. It's, it's those small, teeny, tiny changes. Uh, what do you think habits have a role to play in, in yeah. this? Habits, I think habits is a way of, uh, of fast tracking your freedom. So in a very basic form, having habits, having, uh, maybe I say habits is the wrong word, but routine, uh, a structure, a framework sometimes habits is is almost assuming that it's a, it's a it's a given we don't have to think about doing it but i think a routine is something that's not quite as easy but is something that can be followed and framework so for example getting up in the morning i get up i go for my run i have my multivitamin i have my probiotic a protein shake a banana and i get on with the day and then in the evening i take the dog out for a walk let her play on the beach and I have a sauna and write my diary and go to bed. And that, that kind of framework can mean that you don't have to think about it. Um, it means it gives you um, a constant in a changing environment all the time. It makes you feel like you're a little bit more in control, which I think a lot of us crave and need. Um, but it's in its very simplest form, it gives us, a framework to work to every day. Um, I set up stuff the same. I'm quite specific with, you know, I'm quite a tidy person. And so I'm making sure everything's in the right place when I go to bed and when I wake up my, my desk and my, my, my little office set up, which I'm in now is, is the same every day. So I don't have to think about anything. Uh, and that way it gives my mind and my business everything more space to grow because i don't have to think about the other things it's like the whole added of you know every successful businessman should just have one one suit uh so they don't have to think about it they don't have to make decisions and they can use that energy on other other things to do with their their business um so i don't have a suit but i do have a have a routine and that will make your life more fun to read give you that freedom to play around with other stuff yeah right? Of course, of course. Hmm. How how was the mental journey throughout from the training phase to the running phase to, and to the phase after? Like, I'm sure it, it's a story of resilience, right? Well, well, yeah, I, I like, to, I mean, if we want to put a gloss on it, resilience is, is something that we all experience on a sliding scale. Do I think I'm a very resilient person? I think I'm pretty resilient. I don't think I'm very resilient. And I don't think I was particularly resilient throughout my running the world journey. I think I was just stubborn. I was, uh, and I, and I, truly, uh, I truly think sometimes resilience can be the glossy word for stubbornness. And I think, I think stubbornness is, is the reality of, of going, no, I will finish this. I will complete this. And a lot of that comes from truly wanting it truly truly wanting to achieve what you're after i see lots of people training for marathons and races half marathons 5ks 10ks and you can very easily see the people that are genuinely interested in finishing that race or doing well in that race and that's because they wanted to do it so i think that's a big basis of of my my mindset but you know remember i i'd raced hundreds of events before i i, I started planning running the world it then took me 674 days to finish that mission, to complete that that mission that I set out for you know, four years prior, two years of planning, and then two years of traveling around the world, hopping from country to country, running a marathon in each one every few days, um, running everything anywhere up to you know, between two, three, four, and five countries a week. Um, but then I came home. And I then went on to do other missions. I ran north to south of Italy. I did London to Paris. I went to the Arctic Circle. I circumnavigated Britain. Um, and physically, 
I was always challenging myself. I was always changing. I was always adapting. I was always stubborn to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Simple as that. That's a really good world view. Stubbornness gives your life worth living and gives meaning to your life. Do you think that? (laughs) Absolutely. Okay. Uh, You were talking, I was listening to your other talks and you were talking a little bit about your mentor and how Mm. he helped in your journey. Yeah. So I have a few, I have a few mentors, if you like. Um, but yeah, Mark, Mark Beaumont is, is a, is a good unofficial mentor in my life. It's not somebody I speak to on a weekly, monthly, sometimes even a yearly basis, but he's somebody that has been there in the key points to guide me through the maze that is becoming an adventure athlete and doing this kind of career. He's, Anybody who doesn't know Mark's Mark Beaumont cycled around the world. He's various world records, an incredible cyclist, um, and he gave me a lot of the knowledge and, and the pitfalls. Gave me great contacts, and I think, and I, as I'm a mentor to other people, a key part of being a mentor, or being a mentee, is listening to the advice and um, what's the words. Uh, adapting it to your scenario to adapting it to your situation um, and being prepared that you don't necessarily have the same skills as them and they'd have the same skills as you but there is information to be shared that will support each other Um, and a network of people a network of contacts and be open and free with all of that information to support each other as human beings is, is all you can ask for. And, and he's, he's been a, an incredible inspiration and um, continues to be. And, and if I ever need a, a, ha- a hand or a help with something, I know I can drop him a message and have a chat and, and he'll support. Mm-hmm. Is there something which he taught you that still sticks in your head? Oh, lots, <laughs> lots and lots of things. Um, I think that one of the, the key things we sat down uh, in a cafe and he was saying, so Mark has cycled around the world twice and he did it the first time when he was young, slightly slower. And then he did it when he was slightly older and he did it much quicker, 80 days in less than 80 days. Incredible achievement. And he said, you know, when he did it the first time, he was just fumbling through. It was just, um, kind of a what is the phrase like a missy mickey mouse approach it was just getting it done nothing very professional just experiencing it and then the next time you have to kind of be more professional you have more sponsors you know that the book deals you know all of that sort of stuff already exists and so it feels more like uh like work like um like you have to balance the business and the adventure side uh, and i took it to i took a key message from that which is just to enjoy the phase that you're in and you don't have it have it doesn't have to become anything that it isn't and that's very much what i did with running the world we didn't get anything perfect everything was messy we had lots of setbacks lots of issues to overcome uh, but that was part of the journey and just to to accept it and embrace it hmm the journey is what matters right yeah yeah and the and the, the moments within within those steps absolutely yeah Hmm. Was there a time when you were running, you feel like this is not for me, just have to run out from this and no. you embraced it? No? No. Um, okay. There was never, a, there was never a moment where I, I didn't want to do it. There was plenty of moments when I wanted to pause because I was too tired, unwell, fatigued, uh, mentally drained, you know, family love life stuff that life happens and you know and no matter what you're doing whether you're running around the world or whether you're just having a bad day at work there's always those moments where you just want to hit and pause and go oh, I just want to get out and and, and sort my mind out and, and and tidy tidy my mental thoughts up um, but you can't do that when you're running a marathon in every every country in the world you have to continue and you have to, to persevere uh, with those with those difficult times um, and that's 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 where 
that's that's where the resilience comes in. I think that's where you have to go right. Well, it's not a case of stubbornness because, like I said earlier, stubbornness is the overarching. I want to finish this. The resilient moments is okay. I'm ill. I want to get out. Do I want to get out of bed? Probably not. Um, I feel unwell. I feel tired. I feel exhausted. But I'm going to do it because I'm resilient enough to know that I'm so stubborn I don't want it to end. That's that's the reality. Um, and what do I think about in those moments? Um, I think about the work that's gone in to get me there. I also think about the alternative of, so if I don't finish this, if I don't get out of bed, if I don't run, if I don't get on that next plane and go and do the next country, A, I won't have seen the country. I won't have experienced those memories. B, I'll feel... Um, like I've let myself down. I feel like I wouldn't have reached my potential on that given moment. C, I might have to go home and get a real job. That wouldn't be as fun. Um, and there's plenty of plenty of options where I think a lot of people that do endurance, they simply put themselves in scenarios where quitting is not an option, whether it be because you'll let sponsors down, you'll lose your funding, whether it be because you're already invested so much you can't quit now because then you'll never have another opportunity to do it. That's the reality of enduring through some of these things. Mm. Maybe p- part of that answer is putting your skin in the game so that you get mm. your ass out of it. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Right? You have to. You have to be invested. Yeah. Uh, and I saw that you ran with nine precedents <laughs> from your book. Yeah, ran with lots of lots of brilliant, brilliant people. I um, one of the examples was uh, the president of Zambia, uh, and I was I happened to be in a hotel in um, I think it was Kinshasa, um, so the Congo. And there was a head of state um, funeral in the Congo, Democratic People's Republic of Congo, I think. And I was staying in this hotel. It was the only, only, only good hotel in the vicinity. And I went out of ran, came back sweaty in my vest, sat down for breakfast because I was. I went out very early because I needed to beat the heat, um, and got back from my run. And I just plonked myself down in the in the breakfast room at this hotel. And I happened to accidentally sit next to the president of Zambia, the guy called Edgar. And his his men and his bodyguards, if you like, came and immediately tried to usher me away and were a little alarmed that I'd sat there. And and he said, no, 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 stay. And uh, and we chatted a bit and and we he insisted we did a lap of um, of uh, of the swimming pool of the hotel so he could he said he could have done done some running with me which i thought was very nice um and and you know president of slovenia was a great runner um lots of other people not just presidents and and prime ministers but also um uh key people in the british government in the british embassy um lots of brilliant people came out and supported and um, and thousands and thousands of runners all over the world so very very fortunate hmm what was what was that drastic world view that changed before and after like something that completely broke your like was mm-hmm. like a mind boggling thing yeah very very big thing which was what you see on the news what you experience the world to be through a screen is not the world that exists on a daily basis for example it's very easy to use rich and poor um as a, as a as a go-to example but actually let's use the example of rain <laughs> because i go to the bahamas you expect it to be hot white sandy beaches suntan lovely i turned there i turned up there and it was torrential rain i was running through kind of you know ankle deep water most of the time it was completely flooded and nothing to do with nothing like I was expecting the Bahamas to be. My ex, my expectations, my preconceptions of these places was not correct. And so you extrapolate that out to places in the world that have war and volatility within their pol- political systems, unrest. In going into Syria, for example, I was scared of 
being around violence and war torn a war torn city of Damascus. Um, and yet, when I got there, I ended up running with a with a junior national football team, female football team, that was coached by a guy who lived in the UK. And there was a pristine pitch. This loop and, and I had the most amazing experience. So my overarching theme was that it the world is not as you see it through the media because it can't be because there's so many differences in the world, uh, and that leads me on to the you know the, the big headline is is that people are <laughs> people are wonderful. You know we see lots of war and terror because it always makes the news, but you're seeing a tiny fraction of the existence of the of humanity. Um, so we are we are all brilliant brilliant beings in this in this rare rare little planet in our solar system yeah that's i think that's a psycho that's basic human psychology as well because bad news catch up they spread like yeah, wildfire yeah. and our brain it it stores that uh, like who sees good news like if, if there yeah. is a I I remember seeing a thought experiment like imagine there was a channel that only put up, puts out good news nobody would see it. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and we uh, I I actually follow a few channels like that, and it's hard to see the content because all the other stuff, it, it, all the other stuff surrounds it. it it's literally the case, um, and it's because bad news is more unique, and that's the reality because we live in a world that's actually brilliant we are desensitized to seeing the brilliance and we just see the bad stuff unfortunately so um, trying to trying to live every day realizing that there's a lot of good going on even if there are bad things out there mhm well, was there any countries you feel like okay this is going to be a you were prepared for this is going to be a horrible experience but it turned out pretty nice and the other way around well absolutely yeah syria is a great example um I was scared to be there. Similar with Somalia, Mogadishu, I was expecting, uh, and Libya, actually, um, places that are war-torn, potentially dangerous places, some cities to go through. Nearly every single place that I thought, bar a couple, bar a handful, that I thought were going to be difficult, whether it be stressful for the safety-wise or for running, just logistically running, most of the time it was the opposite that happened um and i had to take a step back and i think that's why a lot of people when you travel you start to calm down and ease because you all always your preconceptions are misjudged and you realize there's no point second guessing or assuming what you're going to experience you just need to take every moment as it happens that's quite a nice or very nice element of travel um and i was certainly in a bit of a a calm mode when i came back because of that Hmm. Certainly talking about that calm mode running is a type of meditation, right? Mm. Yeah, of course. You need I think people can meditate, they can sit on a mat and say om and and be very spiritual or they can do the dishes, washing up or you can do some knitting or you can ride a bike or you can go for a run. Everybody has their own space where they switch off. um and i think when we talk about meditation we talk about clearing our minds i don't think running you have a i don't have necessarily have an empty mind but i think my mind is is happy content in that moment um and that's part of meditation i think so yeah it's uh, it's a therapy it's a, it's a huge therapy for millions of people around the world Hmm. like do your thought patterns change because the reason i'm asking this is because last week i did this 12 hour walk challenge it i'm not a walking and i'm not a running person but still mm-hmm. i did this 12 hour it was a great challenge for me uh, there's this guy colin or brady or something he yeah. you might know him yeah so i saw yeah. that uh, thought i might as well give it a try and i started walking and you can see that mental fluctuation change happening when you start walking in the middle and somewhere your mind starts doing different things do you feel mm-hmm. that uh, when you when you start running you have a different set of thought patterns and when you when you reach a certain point where you just keep on running and running and running and your mind just closes a barrier do you feel that 
yes, it's it is a bit different when you've done it so much because the expectation of that existing is there, uh, and so you are aware that it's going to be happening. Just like if you were to have lots of alcohol one evening, you know you're going to have a hangover the next day. You know you you expect it. With running, it's the opposite, right? You know that if you go for a run, even if it's difficult, even if you suffer, even if you want to stop, you know that there's benefits of not stopping. And so you continue and then you receive those benefits when you finish and you can feel elated. So having that different mindset throughout each stage of the run and and a different type of meditation. You know, if I go out for a run in the morning, I'm probably half asleep. It might be raining. My purpose for the run in the morning is to take the dog out and let her run around. And then before I know it, I'm happy, running a little bit quicker, enjoying the scenery, taking in nature, seeing the birds, seeing the ocean, and then coming home and I feel happy. Um, I know that that's going to happen every day. And that's why I get out of bed the next day to do it. So the more you can do it, the better, uh, the better and easier it is. Mm. Interesting. Because that was like a, my walk, the 12 hour walk was like a roller coaster ride for me. <laughs> Did you, uh, what, what was your, what was your feeling at the end? At the end? At the end, it was definitely calmer and something. So by the way he defines it, Colin is like, you have to set an intention before you leave. And so you can, so uh, the way I say it is like, your mind kind of changes all the time. It was telling me stories every second. So one moment I feel like, okay, I should just quit. Other moment I think I should keep doing this. Another so other moment there was nothing. So I feel I understood that this is the way that mind works. Like what you want to do, you can just keep on going. Your there will be that feedback from your head happening all the time that kind of wants want you to get you out of that place in your place. So you you gotta be separate from it so that's something that i got from the journey and at the end uh, i still so that message i think would be what stuck on with me after the journey yeah yeah and certainly i i really loved it and uh, it was refreshing the next day my legs were swollen i couldn't walk but it was still worth the walk i walked like 33 34 kilometers nothing compared to you but (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's great that's great you're outdoors for that long that's that's brilliant yeah uh what's your diet like what, what was your diet like when you were on the journey very very i mean diet hugely different depending on the different phases of my life if you like during running the world i was eating anything everything and anything because i needed to get calories in um, it was the diet most of the time was poor because I was eating convenience food, fast food, fatty foods, anything that would simply allow me to continue having enough calories for the following day's um, activity. And I say activity because it's not necessarily running. It's running, but getting on a plane, getting in a taxi, traveling to another place, being awake for a long period of time, connecting multiple flights. If you go on holiday, you have you know one or two flights maybe, but for some of my flights, certainly in the Pacifics, were four or five flights just to get somewhere. So I was awake for a long time. I was eating in airports. A lot of airports aren't like the Western airports that we know, uh, and you can't have there's not access to a lot of food. So my diet was very much eat anything I could. Similarly, when I ran around Britain with my run Britain trip, uh, running two marathons a day for four months i was eating between five and eight thousand calories every day uh multiple fast foods anything i could get my hands on and i still at the end of that trip were it was around 2.9 something like that 2.9 percent body fat so incredibly incredibly skinny underweight even though i had been taking all this food in terms of diet day to day um i'm vegetarian i try not to eat too badly for too long so what i mean by that is i can eat terribly but i won't eat terribly for long periods of time okay so to to, i think balance is that that's how i have balance in my diet is is if i want 
chocolate, if I want fizzy drinks, if I want that sort of stuff, then I can have it. But at some point, I'm going to need to cut those out completely to balance the scales. So there's a long period of time where I've been without chocolate, um, long period of time where I was vegan. Uh, I haven't had any alcohol for eight years now. Um, there's a lot of a lot of things that I do to balance my diet. So it's not as unhealthy as it as it could be, because I'm always, always flexible with my food because I enjoy it and I don't want to, you know, talking about, you know, getting to the end of the day going, was I happy with that day? If I'm cutting out all the things I love all the time, then it becomes very unenjoyable. So giving yourself some parameters. Okay, I know I eat a lot of crisps. That means I'm going to cut out crisps for a year or cut out crisps for six months. Uh, and that way, like you said about training your, your body to want the things, you just need to practice it. And then all of a sudden you don't, you don't want the crisps and you don't think about it and you're, you're living slightly healthier. So, yeah. Part of the journey is, I think, also learning to say no to that uh, craving that comes from inside you, right? Uh, mm. Was like, have, were you ever been non-vegetarian? And why, yeah. why did you switch to vegetarian? Like, wh what's the benefit there? Well, th that was a simple switch because I, I love animals so much. Um, it wasn't dietary. Uh, that was seeing too many videos about the intelligence of pigs and cows and the effects on the environment as well. And loving dogs and having a, a, my dog Poppy in my life, then realized like I can't carry on eating animals that are just as intelligent, and just as uh aware of the world as she is so um yeah i, I decided to cut it out for that reason mm -hmm. it's funny that uh, makes me remember of a quote like if you if you squash a cockroach you are a villain if you squash a butterfly <laughs> uh, sorry the other way if you squash a butterfly yeah, yeah. you are a villain and if you squash a cockroach you are a hero beauty has aesthetic <laughs> yeah. benefits <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, mate. You're absolutely right. We see things like that. Um, we actually, um, we had a we had a mouse in the house not so long ago. And, you know, the, the immediate thing is you just put a trap down. And I just couldn't put, a, I couldn't kill it. So we put a, we put a, a, um, a trap to, to catch it and then to release it. Um, so yeah, and that's changed me. Talking about, you know, your earlier question of have you changed? That's one thing. You know, I wouldn't have considered that five years ago and uh, now uh, very much um, very much care about animals hmm. how, how, do, how do you deal with burnout hmm. um, burnout physically or mentally one which work because physically I'm I don't get too burnt out because even though I'm doing crazy missions I know those missions are going to end at some point. So I, I can then have the balance. Um, I truly don't feel like, yeah, me, yeah, mental burnout. I, I don't, I don't think I've experienced mental burnout in its purest form. I think I've experienced it in the, and been very aware of it as it's happening. Um, working hard, having lots of time behind the screen, uh, just, just balancing the, the daily admin, you know, I can't be a runner and do all of my running outdoors, enjoyable time without having time behind the laptop, behind the screens on phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to have that balance, but burnout, I can't, you know, I can't honestly remember a time where I felt true burnout. I've worked too hard for too long in my old job, but now I'm at an age and have the perspective where I try not to let that happen um stress um worries concerns anxiety depression these are all things that all of us experience on a sliding scale but i think if you can have something that you love at the center of what you're doing every day i love to run i love to be outdoors then everything else feels less like you can burn out i like to think of it as like if we have a strong why on why as to we are doing things you will never be unhappy and you will always have that that aura to that pushes you forward yeah yeah of course um uh, the, 
the why of why I do all of this is, is to be totally honest, is because it's an enjoyable existence. It's a much better existence than working hard for 40, 50 years and then potentially not living to see that day. You use Kev as an example of, okay, well, I could go and earn a load of money, buy a big house, go on loads of holidays every year, uh, every day, nine to five or 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. maybe work behind a desk, earn that money. But what if I don't get to retirement? What if I don't get to those holidays because I trip over, hit my head, get hit by a bus, become ill, whatever it may be. So I live my days by going, I'm doing this. And if tomorrow doesn't happen, that's OK, because I'm enjoying the now. That's that's the fundamentals. Um, I don't see it. Yeah, I don't see it any other way now. It's very hard to very hard to when you've been, it's been um, exposed to somebody like that. Yeah, I saw you talking about the number 29747 days, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, yeah, 29,747 days. Yeah, that's how many days we have um, to live on the planet. An average human being, a British human being will have just under 30,000 days. Um, and if you take away time you spend sat in a car, behind a desk, we spend nine years, if you're British, the average British person spends nine years of their life sitting behind a TV or watching, sorry, watching, sitting in front of a TV, watching the TV. Take all of that chunk of time out, sitting in cars, waiting for trains, waiting for buses, commuting to and from work, all of that stuff, sleeping, <laughs> that kind of thing. You have the tiny, tiny, you have just a few thousand days of time that you are experiencing doing what you love being around your loved ones, going and watching a sunset. You know, if you think about, let's say you speak to somebody and they say, yeah, I love, I love watching the sunset. And you say, well, okay, well, how many hours worth of sunsets have you watched in, have you had in your life? Maybe they've had, if they're lucky, 50 hours. Let's say they've watched 200 sunsets for, for 20 minutes, something like that. Then they, that's great. But in reality, we have years and years of our life not doing the stuff that we want. So it's just about forming a life, creating a life as best you can to, to do the stuff that you love. Um, and learn first. It's about setting that intention and having that grit. And yeah, another thing I've heard you talk about is how good people were, how your notions of people change and how good the relations you established in your journey. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. How was that experience? People were people were wonderful. Everywhere I went, smiling faces, welcoming hearts, homes, kindness, selflessness. Every single country in the world offered me one of those at one point or another, or all of them. Having people come together and connect and want me to succeed in my mission, want me to succeed for the charity, but also just want to be able to offer help, guidance, a bed for the night, somewhere to stay, some options to get me into another country. Um, and very simply, just friendly, happy, smiling, waving faces all over the world that I ran past. Even if I had nothing to do with them, never saw them again. I interacted with them for just a couple of moments. A smile and some open kindness can go a very long way. Um, I was blown away by the realities of how human beings are, are brilliant. Hmm. What, what was your hardest run and what was your easiest run? <laughs> My hardest run oh, says a lot, a uh, lot for different reasons. The one that comes to mind, which was in Djibouti, uh, it was very, very hot, um, 50 plus and running on my own streets were empty because it was so hot. Uh, and I was tired, very, very fatigued, um, in central, central Africa, in Africa all over really. And then another one was in, uh, Bangladesh. I was ill, very ill, um, kidney infection, food poisoning, and it was hot, 40 odd degrees, very humid. And I had to get out and run and, 
I just didn't want to. I was just so ready to go to sleep that day. Um, but other than that, the best kind of runs were where you've had thousands of people come out and run with you. Unexpected surprises of, of visiting schools, of visiting cancer wards that I could go and then talk about my journey and why I was doing it to people. Interactions with people that have seen seen war and change and volatility in their country and that they have triumphed through it hearing other people's stories um yeah there's there's countless 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 days of just brilliance throughout the whole trip so what what, what are your plans now mm-hmm. what are your future plans do you plan to run on the moon now <laughs> i'd love to run on the moon um I haven't I haven't crossed it off the list. I have considered writing to a few of the few of the companies and said uh say uh well why not? Why not? Um <laughs> um no I I don't plan to run on the moon but I would love to. Um I I've got a few missions coming up over the next few years. I mean, you know, running around Britain that was a, a big trip and you know the books out. We have another book coming out later this year. and i'm spending most of my time prepping planning run weekends taking people away um to various brilliant places all over the world corfu dolomites wales um uh, dubai kosovo scotland tajikistan uh yeah we you know run weekends as a business is everything i'm putting my heart in and soul into and i'm loving it because it means i can connect with the people that i've met on running the world i can take other people that haven't experienced the stuff that i have to these great places uh and it can be a business that can support me and my family um so yeah i'm i'm very much getting stuck into that for the next few years but i'm also planning my own individual expeditions alongside finding sponsorship finding funding um and so the next next big mission will be uh well there's two things that we're planning one is north to south of new zealand which will be a zigzag route uh and then the next is um running 1000 marathons in 1000 days uh in north america um so that's that's a big one um uh, but that's that's not not for a while yet a few things on before then well i'll be here in canada let me know <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll be passing through. We're going to do national parks. What is that feeling you get when you when you see that you got to inspire so many people? Um I'm proud and I I think about you know, my future children that I don't have yet, you know, what would they say? What they think about their their dad? And I think that's the main thing is when I'm dead and gone. and i left behind a, a a positive happy trail of people seeing some cool stuff doing some stuff for charity and very importantly like i'm saying all along actually doing what i want in the process you know not just mm-hmm. you know not just working really hard and putting some money in a pot for a charity and that's it and you you close the door actually having all of that um i love to see people that are inspired by what i'm doing more so that because it's going to hopefully impact their lives and then go on to impact even more um it's just this impatience i have of we have this finite finite existence and the more people that can get that message of just get up off the sofa and do what you love and the worst that can happen is that you come back and you sit on that sofa but you might as well get up and try so that's the that's the reality i want to just share with with everybody um and i'm hoping that run weekends will 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 help promote that that is a strong motivator isn't it <laughs> absolutely where in uh, where in canada are you uh i live in uh, it's close to toronto it's a city called cambridge which way is that uh so that's west of toronto west of toronto okay and an hour west of toronto Oh nice okay yeah 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 I can picture it uh, you you've been here right where, where did you run in canada young street T- I... T- toronto youngs yeah yeah young street yeah i used to live in the uh northern end of young street oh nice it's the yeah, longest I... 
Yeah, yeah. Young Street is the longest right. street in the world. Yeah, longest street in the. You, I used to live at the very end of the yeah of Young Street. At the very end of the long the street. Uh, no, it was very cold when I was there. Loved it though. And you reach three billion people. Yeah, your message. Huge reach. Huge reach. Yeah, we, and it was a bit surprising, but we had um, the charity that we were raising all the funds for was. Uh, Prostate Cancer UK and they had some software that showed how many people had interacted with all the news articles related to me and, and the mission and all over the world doing TV, live TV, podcasts, print interviews, covers, newspapers. They all then revisited it at the end of the trip. So we then had a big boom and, and, and everybody got wind of what I was doing. So um, that was great. And it's something that I should should have promoted even more but had no energy to do so so um, that was a learning from the trip to try and promote it even more mm. who helped you plan your journey I, mean, i imagine the logistics is one of the hardest part yeah the logistics was definitely one of the hardest parts um my family my mum and dad and then a big team we had everything from safety experts psychology tech experts comms people that were sorting out uh, access to free accommodation to airlines my dad did lots of the the bookings of the flights we had about a team of about 19 people um they were remote all of them I was traveling on my own uh, and then various people would would support from from their own roles in in different parts of the world as the trip progressed but um yeah technology was very useful I couldn't have done it without that hmm All right all right that's about some of the things i wanted to talk with you and explore mm. your mind and uh mm. how 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 have you changed as, as a person before and after right now who what was the nick 10 years before what is the nick now yeah um the nick now is karma is as in even more impatient to do stuff but in a in a less less haste way you know what was the what's the phrase less haste more speed i was i i'm happier and more content progressing and building things slower i feel like the world is tiny in comparison to what i felt like before on one hand and then on the other hand having seen every country in the world it's opened my eyes to how much of the world i've not seen as well you know the the reality of if i had an entire lifetime a thousand lifetimes i wouldn't be able to visit everywhere in the world that's 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 this special realization of uh, although the world is tiny and i see it now and i can imagine and see the cultures and see the languages see the alphabet see the the weather see the geography of all these countries that i've been to there are still so many places that i've never heard of that i will never be able to visit because the world is vast <laughs> that's you know so there's there's the both um i'm more confident now i am more aware of how much help people in the world need hence creating my charity the 196 foundation i am more at ease with myself knowing that i have achieved a great thing that i'm proud of and that i had the courage to try whereas before i hadn't done that so i'm just grateful i think i think the i think the biggest if i could sum it up in one word is i'm grateful now from where i was before because of so much what i've done what i'm doing what it led on to do and ultimately having that message from kev that that sparked it all in the first place i'm very grateful grateful for grateful for him to uh do you know this idea of synchronicity in which the world speaks to you hmm. yeah go on what what's your thoughts on that yeah have you had any experience where you like go you go to that situation you put yourself there and you just kind of connect hmm. and it the world opens up for you makes your journey easier in ways which you never thought in a million years would happen honestly the whole trip every single trip every single 
part of every journey I've done, whether it's running north to south of Italy, 100 miles in 100 days, whether it's running the 5,250 miles around Britain, running London to Paris, running around the world, all of that stuff that I've done is exactly what you've just described. Everything came together to make that happen. There isn't one moment, there is moment after moment after moment, because without it, it wouldn't have happened. Um, very much so. Well, the reason I tell this because uh, there's this book called Alchemist from Polo Coelho. It speaks yeah, about this. The, the whole, whole, whole book is about this thing. And right. It's how the world opens to you and how, how things just show up in front of you and kind of, do, do you believe that everything is predetermined? No. No? No. At all. Um, okay. We, we make, we make our days. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Ah. Uh, Ah, that's it, man. Nothing is coming to my thank end for you. now. No, thank you for chatting. Um, yeah, really good to chat. And uh, let me know when it's out and I'll share it. Sure. Where, 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 yeah, where can people find you about people what that you're doing me. and your future projects? Yeah. Yeah, people can find me on uh, nickbutter.com uh, or on my Instagram, nickbutterrun. Uh, and the future stuff with run weekends and taking people away to do these cool trips is just www.runweekends.com have a look at run weekends see the trips we have um, and yeah come and come and run with us thank you nick for all that you're putting out to the world and for being such a good inspiration to the world thank you for the platform and yeah really lovely to chat with you mate Well, that was Nick Butter on The Seekers Mind Talks. Hope you all enjoyed the show and don't forget to support us with your likes and comments. Until next time, this is your host Raj signing off from The Seekers Mind Talks.